Hello, so in this particular capsule, we are going to begin with a very amusing exercise. Namely, we are going to take ordinary differential equations and these differential equations we have already come across many times and these differential equations are second order ODEs with polynomial coefficients. A number of these are displayed in the slide but before we come to that, why are we looking at these differential equations? Because tempered distributions can be differentiated and they can be multiplied by polynomials. So the class of tempered distributions is closed under differentiations and multiplication by polynomials. It's of interest to know whether these differential equations have solutions which are outside the scope of classical solutions. That is, do they have generalized solutions, solutions which are tempered distributions. So we got a number of interesting examples on these kinds of differential equations that arise from mathematical physics. And here is a list. Let's go down the list. The first is 1 minus x squared y double prime minus 2xy prime plus p into p plus 1y equal to 0, the Legendre equation. The next one, 1 minus x squared y double prime minus xy prime plus p squared by the Chebyshev's equation. The third one, x squared y double prime plus xy prime plus x squared minus p squared y equal to the Bessel's equation of order p. The next one is Laguerre equation, xy double prime plus 1 minus xy prime plus lambda y equal to 0. And the last one we haven't discussed in this particular course, but it is one of the most important differential equations because that encompasses all else, x into 1 minus xy double prime plus c minus a plus b plus 1 x y prime minus a b y equal to 0. That's the famous hypergeometric differential equation of Gauss. The literature on the hypergeometric equation is vast and rich and the mathematics uh, underlying this was also rich. And this was a subject of Gauss's great memoir in 1812. I think I mentioned this memoir earlier in some connection with the gamma functions. All these differential equations have polynomial coefficients, so we must ask whether these differential equations have solutions in the space of tempered distribution. The classical theory of ODEs, for example, the Picard's theorem and the theorem on linear differential equations, that the space of solutions of a linear ODE is a vector space or the dimension of this vector space which is equal to the order of the differential equation. But this theorem fails when you cross a singular point. So what are the singular points? The Legendre and the Chebyshev's equation, the first two, these equations misbehave at plus minus one. x equal to one and x equal to minus one are singular points. The third and the fourth, the Bessel's equation, the Laguerre equation, have singularities at the origin. And the last one has singularities at 1 and 0. So theorem that we talked about, that the space of solutions is a vector space whose dimension matches with the degree of the differential equation, that holds only in the intervals over which there are no singularities. So now, can it happen? that on the entire real line, if I look at the picture, can it have more solutions? Can it have solutions which, have, which are tempered distributions? We shall see that the answer is going to be yes in general. But rather than develop this theory in generality, we don't have time for those kinds of things. Let us look at a amusing special case, the case of the Cauchy-Euler equation, the familiar undergraduate differential equation x squared y double prime plus x y prime minus y equal to 0, the familiar Cauchy-Euler equation. When you give it to your undergraduate students, they will immediately tell you the solutions. They will substitute y equal to x to the power m and they will find the indicial equation. What is the indicial equation? m into m minus 1 plus m minus 1 equal to 0. Substitute x to the power m in 10.18 and the index m will be a root of the quadratic equation m squared minus 1 equal to 0. So m has to be 1 or minus 1. So solutions are x and 1 upon x. Everybody will give you this pair of solutions. But remember that this will form a basis of solutions on the open interval 0 infinity. B both x and 1 upon x have extensions to the real line. How? x of course is a 
polynomial, so it's defined on the entire real line. 1 upon x extends on the real line as a tempered distribution. PV1 over x is extension, for instance. Of course, a zero function is also a solution. It's a, it's a space of solutions, a vector space. And so zero element should be there. Now let us consider 10.19. Let us cook up this function x times the heavy side function. Why am I taking the heavy side function? In the earlier line, I mentioned the zero function. Why is it that I bring in the zero function? Let us do the following. Let us look at the interval minus infinity to zero separately and let's look at the interval zero to infinity separately. So x is a solution in the positive real line and zero is a solution on the negative real line. Can I try to paste these two solutions together, namely the solution which is zero in the negative real line, it continues to be zero at the origin, and on the positive real line, it is x. What is that function I get? x into hx. So x into hx is obtained by pasting the zero solution in one half and the x solution in the other half. Of course, this function 10.19, x hx is continuous on the real line, but it is not differentiable at the origin. It's not differentiable at the origin. So let us take its derivative at the origin. What is the first derivative of y1? You cal do the calculation and you're going to notice that the first derivative is going to be hx. Of course, you have to apply the product rule. There will be a term involving hx and there will be a term involving x times h prime of x. The first term is hx and that I have written down. What about the second term? Why have I missed out the second term? The, what is the second term? x times h prime of x. What is h prime of x from the previous capsules? h prime of x is the Dirac delta. So what is the other term that I have not written here? Is there a typo? No, there is no typo here. The term that has been dropped has been deliberately dropped. It is x times Dirac delta. And we proved in the last capsule that x times the Dirac delta is 0. That's why that term has not been written here. Now compute the second derivative y double prime. It is simply h prime of x and h prime of x is simply the Dirac delta. So we have our y prime and we have our y double prime. Let us substitute into the differential equation. The second derivative is y double prime, that is Dirac delta. When I multiply the Dirac delta by x squared, it disappears. And then what about the middle term? x times y prime is x hx. What's the last term? y. But what is y? x times hx and that cancels out. So sure enough, 10.19 is a solution of the differential equation. So we have obtained a solution of 10.18 that is not even once differentiable. So I must think of this 10.19 as a tempered distribution that satisfies the ODE. Now let us take the next problem. Check that delta naught is also a solution of the ordinary differential equation. It is not difficult to check that delta naught is a solution of the ordinary differential equation. You have to compute the second derivative of delta and the middle one involves the first derivative of delta. Remember x times delta naught prime. x times delta naught prime, if you go to the previous capsules, we have computed that. It is minus delta naught. So for, for the middle term and the last term, you're going to get minus 2 delta naught. And for the first one, you are going to get 2 delta naught and you are going to check that delta naught is indeed a solution of the ODE. So now we've got one more solution, delta naught. Now let's go further. The, the situation gets even more interesting as we go further. Check that PV1 over X satisfies the ODE. Let us call PV1 over X as Y just to simplify the notations. So Y is a tempered distribution. And I have to check that x squared y double prime plus x y prime minus y, that will be a distribution. And that distribution will be the zero distribution. That's what we have to check. So that distribution paired with g must give me zero is what we need to check. So look at this pairing very carefully. Separate the terms. x squared y double prime paired with g. First, the x squared will have to go to g. And the derivatives will have to be transferred to the other factor twice. So we'll pick up two negative signs and then there's positive sign. 
and the middle term first the x has to be transferred to g and then the derivative but you will pick up a negative sign and the last term of course the negative sign simply goes over here so it is y paired with x squared g double prime minus x g prime minus g equal to 0 this pairing that's what we have to check we need to prove this let us look at the left hand side what is the left hand side the pv1 over x what's the definition of pv1 over x pv1 over x is you integrate mod x bigger than or equal to epsilon 1 upon x and then the other factor here. Now what you do is you would compute the, the derivatives. g is very smooth so I can calculate the derivative of this and I can calculate the second derivative of this. When you calculate the second derivative the g term disappears completely. You will get a 2g here and you get a g here and you get a g here. So there is no g term and there is an other terms will involve an x factor and that x factor got cancelled by the 1 upon x and we are left with just this. But remember g prime is very smooth, x g double prime is very smooth. So this limit as epsilon goes to 0, mod x bigger than or equal to epsilon, I can just knock this off. It will simply be integral over the real line g prime plus x g double prime dx. And you compute this integral using fundamental theorem of calculus. g is rapidly decreasing. Remember as x goes to infinity and as x goes to minus infinity, it is 0. And so this first term will become 0. For the second term, integrate by parts twice and check and we will get 0. And so yes, we have checked that PV1 over x also satisfies the ODE. Now we have got four solutions of the ordinary differential equation. x, x, h, x, Dirac delta and PV1 over x. Now I am asking you to show that these four functions are linearly independent. First of all, the first two are linearly independent. Why is that? How do you check that two non-zero vectors are linearly independent? The first vector is non-zero, so it's already linearly independent. And now, if the second vector is a linear multiple of the first, then they are linearly dependent. If the second one is not a multiple of the first, it will be linearly independent. So the question is, can x h x be a linear multiple of x? No, because x is differentiable everywhere x h x is not differentiable at the origin. So the second one is not a scalar multiple of the first one. So the first two are linearly independent. Is the third one a linear combination of the first two? Answer is going to be no. I want you to prove it because this Dirac delta much more singular than the previous two. And the fourth one is even more singular than the Dirac delta. So each one of these things is progressively a more complicated distribution. So these are going to be linearly independent. I leave the amusing verification for you to check by yourself. The next question I'm asking you is, is every solution of the ODE a linear combination of these? So we have seen that the space of solutions is at least four dimensions. Now you'll ask me, is it exactly four dimensional or are there other things also? That's a question I'm leaving it open. We cannot carry out this discussion to completion because there is lack of time and uh, the relevant material from distribution theory that you need for a systematic handling of these kinds of matters is about homogeneous distributions and the exact material is available on page 68 and the following pages in this monumental account of Lars Hormander Analysis of Linear Partial Differential Operators Volume 1, Springer Verlag, 1990. We have to move on with other things. The next important concept is convergence in the space of distributions. So the space of distributions is the dual space. Remember, S of R, the Schwarz class, is a locally convex topological vector space and we are talking about the dual space. The dual space carries the weak star topology. So the topology on the space of distributions will be a weak star topology. Now we shall discuss the notion of convergence or sequential convergence, convergence of sequences. So we define the notion of weak star convergence, so sequential convergence. So sequence of distributions is said to converge to U weakly if for each rapidly decreasing function g, when I pair u nu with g, it goes to the pairing u g. That is u nu paired with g as nu tends to infinity will go to u paired with g. 
This is a very weak form of convergence and it's comparable to an important concept we already encountered before in which chapter, chapter 7, we talked about weak convergence in Hilbert spaces. And this notion should be compared with the corresponding notion in Hilbert spaces. Weak convergence in Hilbert. It's in fact weaker than that. So let us look at some examples. We already know from chapter 7 that sin nu x converges to 0 weakly in an L2 sense. L2 of minus pi pi, that's our favorite Hilbert space. And we check that sin nu x converges to 0 weakly. Now here I am asking you to revisit the same example from a different perspective. You have to show that sin nu x, which is a tempered distribution, converges weakly. Of course, sin nu x is a nice bounded function. So when you think of sin nu x as a tempered distribution, how will it pair with, with a g? It will pair with integral sin nu x gx dx. That's a real number and that will depend on nu. So that's a real sequence. That should go to 0 as nu goes to infinity. You need to prove this very carefully because we are not on a bounded interval. We are not in L2 of minus pi pi. This integral is over the real line. So the first thing to do would be use the fact that the g is rapidly decreasing. So outside a compact set, this g is going to be pretty small in, in its integral. And so use the fact that the integral is going to be very, very small outside a compact set, say less than epsilon by 2 in absolute value. Inside the compact set, appeal to Riemann Lebesgue lemma and the job will be done. So item number 1, the answer is yes, it converges to 0 weakly. Show that e to the power minus x squared by n converges weakly to the constant distribution 1. The next thing is, does new sin nu x converge weakly to 0? What about nu to the power k sin nu x? That will also go to 0 weakly. Of course, if you try to do it now, it might be a little painful, but in the immediately in the next few slides, we are going to develop the theory of weak convergence of distributions and using that theory, it will immediately become clear because just as sin nu x converges weakly to 0, cos nu x will also converge weakly to 0. And the, and the distributional derivative of cos nu x is nu sin nu x. And we are going to prove that if u nu is a sequence converging weakly to u, then u nu prime will converge weakly to u prime. Differentiation is continuous with respect to weak star convergence. So using that idea and using the fact that cos nu x goes to 0 weakly, we immediately get that nu sin nu x also converges weakly to 0. And repeat differentiations will give you this as well. Now here I am going to pause and I am going to ask you a question. Now suppose for example, you got a sequence of L2 functions. Take L2 of the real line. Take L2 of the real line, nothing fancy. Take a sequence Fn of L2 functions converging weakly in L2. Then of course it will also converge in the sense of distributions. Because what does weak convergence in L2 mean? Integral fn g will converge to integral f g where g is any L2 function. And so since, since the Schwarz class is sitting inside L2, weak convergence in L2 will imply weak convergence in distributions. So in one direction we have the implication. Is a converse true? Is it true that if a sequence of distributions, something like sin nu x, which converges weakly, will it converge in L2? Of course, sin nu x is not in L2 or the real line, but I can multiply it by a cutoff function, for instance. I can multiply it by a smooth function with compact support, which is 1 on some interval and 0 outside. Answer is again no. Because look at the third exercise here. You can localize it and by multiplying it by a cutoff function and still it will not do it. Because what do we know from chapter 7? Weak convergence in L2 implies norm boundedness. Banach-Steinhaus's theorem. But 
the L2 norms of nu sin nu x even after multiplying by cutoff functions will not remain bounded. So that's the answer to some of these questions. This notion of weak convergence of distributions is a very weak notion. And so you may ask, why are we bothered about this if it is such a weak notion? The reason is very simple. Remember that in analysis, we are want to prove existence theorems. Oh, this differential equation has a solution. That minimizing problem has a solution. The Dirichlet principle, remember, earlier that we discussed. There's a minimizing sequence. But will the minimizing sequence itself have a limit? Usually, when you want to prove existence theorems, you will construct various sequences. And these sequences may not converge in norm. They may not converge in any strong sense. They may converge weakly. And so at least we have a hold on some form of limit. And if you're thinking of a minimizing problem, an objective function which is minimized by a minimizing sequence. And that is the problem that you have to discuss. Will this minimizing sequence have a limit in the class of admissible functions? The point is, first discuss weak convergence. See what the limit is going to be. There's a better chance of hitting the limit with a weak notion of convergence. And then the second problem is, once you hit the limit, even in a weak sense, then you can try to see whether this weak limit that you got, whether that has any better regularity properties. That is one way of using this notion to prove existence theorems in differential equations. Another use of these weak notions is to discuss summability of divergent series. So for example, many of the Fourier series that we will encounter, they will converge conditionally. But I can't differentiate them term by term. When I differentiate them term by term, I am outside the realm of classical analysis. But can you salvage the problem? Is there a way to make sense out of these divergent series in the context of distribution theory? Thereby, you get another tool for handling divergent series. There are other places where you have encountered this kind of weak convergence in measure. You got weak convergence in probability theory, weak convergence of measures. There are a number of applications in probability theory. So this notion is extremely important and a very useful notion. A regular Borel measure with compact support is a tempered distribution after all. So now let us see how weak convergence can be used. A first a couple of theorems. Namely, if a sequence U, UN of distributions converges weakly to U, then the derivatives converge to the corresponding derivative, theorem 122. In other words, differentiation is a continuous operator with respect to the weak star topology in the sequentially continuous. The sequential continuity is what we are talking about here. So let us get to the proof of theorem 122. So suppose un converges to u weakly. What does it mean to say that un prime converges weakly to u prime? Take a function g in the Schwarz class and pair un prime with g. un prime paired with g, what is it? It is minus un paired with g prime. But un converges to u weakly, remember? So minus un paired with g prime converges to minus u paired with g prime. And now put the prime back to where it belongs, namely to u, and the minus sign goes away, that gives you u prime g. So we have proved that un prime paired with g converges to u prime paired with g. This proves that differentiation is a continuous operator where continuity is understood as sequential continuity. And the precise sense is described in theorem 122. So that's one Im important result, an easy result. The next important result pro proceeds along exactly similar lines. Continuity of the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is an operator from S prime to S prime. Will it also be continuous? With respect to the weak star topology, here again I'm talking about sequential continuity or the Fourier transform as an operator on S prime. I think this we shall take up next next time, and we shall look at number of applications to this, and we'll take a 
beautiful example from Fourier series and we will revisit the Poisson summation formula from the earlier chapters and the Jacobi theta function identity. I think I will stop this capsule here. Thank you very much.